from all of the YouTube channels that are out there, if there is one that obviously does not live up to its name, that would undoubtedly be the academic agent. Now, if you are interested in economics and spend a lot of time in this platform, you might have encountered this channel before, like in the debate he did on the labor theory of value with uh, someone that defended it, where he demonstrated that he does not understand under any means the labor theory of value or pretty much anything regarding uh, well the fundamentals of the classical economic theory. And you might also know him from having argued that socialism is a form of fascism, which is an anachronism, and many other things that, well, without any doubt, put him in the category of anti-academic, even though he likes to call himself an academic agent that is a rational person that is come here to YouTube to teach us economics and to teach us politics and to teach us moral foundations and to teach us many things that he actually does not understand. And since he likes to point to Economics 101 by Thomas Sowell every time he's debating someone in economics, as if he was teaching some very basic economic lessons to that person he's debating against, uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to look at his argument uh, and what he uh, and what he's going to say in this video on the classical economists in order to suggest well, in order to see whether or not he actually is the one that should be doing further research and he's the one that should go back to the fundamentals. Because when it comes to this video that we're about to see, it's going to become very obvious that he doesn't understand the classical political economy, even though he's going to try to teach us six key lessons from it that are going to end up being, the conclusion of these six lessons are going to be that the classical economists were neoclassical economists which is bizarre. It's like saying that Keynes was a Friedmanite or, or something like this. So um, we're going to look at this. But first, let's, let's uh, examine the part of his video that I actually agree with and the only part in his video that I think is sound. For those of us with an interest in economics, it is a daily struggle to see so many of the key lessons from classical economics some of which have been widely known since 1776, so keenly ignored and sometimes outright flouted by members of the political class and their various cheerleaders. This is not necessarily a matter of left versus right, because it doesn't matter if you're Labour or Tory, Democrat or Republican, the economic facts don't change, and we see routine and persistent illiteracy on both sides. Before I actually comment on his introduction, first let's let, let's listen to that music. It's it's hideous. It's terrible. Why would you put that music on the background when you're speaking about economics? I mean, it, it's it, it's terrible. It's really annoying. I don't know about you guys, but to me this was very annoying to listen to. Anyhow, aside from that, I have to admit that he's actually right here. There's a lot of people in the political class. Uh, these days in, in Europe and in the US and in many other countries out there that misinterpret economic facts and that misinterpret economic theories from some of the most brilliant minds in the history of economics in order to pursue their own individual political short-term goals that, uh, well, it's misinformation and it's something that we should absolutely be against. But this is precisely what he's doing in this video. So he's going to start the video by saying, oh, I hate it when people comment on the classical economists and, and pretend as is these very important facts and things that the classicals already suggested, um, which are true. Uh, they act as if they weren't and they try to pursue their own political goals. Well, that's exactly what you're doing. You're using ideologically the work of the classical economists and you're going to misinterpret who the classical economists were and many things. But what you're going to do is use ideologically their theories exactly what you're criticizing in the beginning of your video. So, I mean, this is promising already. And with this, I don't mean that you cannot extract important policy lessons from economic theories because this is something this is part of the reason why economics exists not only as a way to describe the economy and the world but also as a way to act upon it in a way that is beneficial however 
Even though I admit that you can, in fact, use for political reasons economic theories, what I don't accept is this propaganda, this deliberate or very incompetent misinterpretation of economic facts and, and, and this uh, ideological usage of these theories in a way that it's not actually uh, well beneficial and that is more misinformation than any other thing, which is precisely what he's criticizing in the beginning of the video. And again, I don't want to criticize people for being slightly wrong sometimes on specific things, because I think that this is something that we all do. We all make mistakes and we are all subject to, to being wrong certain times. However, when you make explicit ideological use of things like this, this is the kind of thing that I want to be critical of and that I want people to realize that they are being scammed, basically, intellectually scammed. The first lesson comes from the man himself, Adam Smith. Wealth is not money, but a measure of the goods and services in the economy as a whole. What we call today the standard of living. So here he's actually right, because Adam Smith did suggest, and it is in fact a an important lesson to be extracted from Adam Smith that wealth is not about holding a lot of paper currency but it has to do a lot more with commodities with services specifically with commodities and societies that are more productive are generally societies that are more wealthy and it is not so much because they have more paper money but it's because that paper money is backed by real tangible commodities and this is a very important lesson that uh, he's obviously going to ignore when it comes to the conclusion that Adam Smith took from it and that the classical economists took from it, which is the distinction between productive and unproductive labor. That, and there's differences because Adam Smith, for example, has a sort of ambiguity in his definition of productive and non-productive labor. But this key insight of wealth not being just about money is going to lead him to see, to suggest that there's some labor that is productive and there's some labor that isn't. And this is a thing that has been ignored ever since the classical tradition. And instead of saying, look, this is the conclusion of this, right? And, and this is an important lesson because I think that when you are doing a proper economic um, well, proper economic thinking requires you to distinguish between the kind of labor that whose wages exchange against variable capital and the kind of labor whose wages ex exchange against revenue, against total revenue. So why is he not going to say that this is the conclusion? So let's contrast this with my own series on the classical economists. So in, the, in my series, I discuss them on their own terms. I, when I looked at a sales law, I discussed it on, on, on the terms of the classical economists that defended sales law, on the terms of, of um, well, on the terms of John Stuart Mill, on the terms of David Ricardo, on the terms of Jean Baptiste. But I, I try to extract from it every single conclusion that I can, because these economists didn't just say one simple line and then forgot about everything else. They had logical conclusions extracting from them, which are sometimes even more important than the initial parts. So why is he not going to say that from this, Adam Smith got this distinction and that this distinction is also a very important lesson to be extracted? Well, because if you make this distinction between productive and non-productive labor, then you might start to speak about surplus value about things that he ideologically doesn't find convenient so yeah it's a good thing to do right to ignore right to just present this simple line and say well this 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 uh, is a very keen insight and then forget about the thing that comes after that so yeah good start this is a very good lesson which brings us to his second key insight the economy is not a zero-sum competition in which one person's gain is another's loss. This common fallacy, which many people still have even now, suggests that the only way that somebody could acquire lots of money is by taking it, whether by force or so-called exploitation, from somebody else. 
So here, once again, he's not entirely wrong because Adam Smith did in fact suggest that when you engage in commerce, not necessarily someone loses and the other one wins from it. But, however, he's going to try to make him sound like this neoclassical standard economist that suggests that markets are always efficient and they always bring a solution that is that works best for everyone, which is actually wrong because Adam Smith did not believe this. He's going to try to make him sound like he was saying this, but Adam Smith was not because Adam Smith, in the time in which he lived, was early capitalism, he understood that capitalism is a specific moment in history that comes from a development and that there is different classes with different interests and that you cannot take the interests of the class that owns the means of production, for example, at face value. That there's actually contrasting uh, right, uh, interests and that there is conflict in the markets, that it's not all just about Oh, people gain from commerce always and everywhere in every time efficient and no, this is in no sense what Adam Smith was saying in, 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 in any of his writings in the Wealth of Nations or anywhere else. His main suggestion is yes, commerce can make people better off, every, every party involved, but not necessarily because there's conflicting interests and you should not take the interests of one class as the standard of the interests of everyone. So he actually had this class distinction in his analysis that of course he's not going to introduce, he's going to consider everyone in the economy as individuals and he's not going to say, well Adam Smith actually introduced class in his economic analysis. Why? Because if he did so, then he would have to speak about some of the most uh, radical uh, parts of Adam Smith's argument that he wants to ignore, of course, because they are not ideologically convenient. Or maybe he just doesn't even know that they exist, because he probably hasn't even read these economists and he probably hasn't even studied them. He just learned a couple of lessons from them, from the books like Thomas Sowell's book, and then he said, well, this is obviously a, a, a very thorough research on the classical economists. Well, it's not, you see. If you really want to understand an economist, you have to look at their work and you have to study it and you have to, well, study it in their own terms, right? Not what the neoclassical version of these arguments say and then say, oh, this is exactly what they were arguing. No, it's not, okay? So again, very poor scholarship that an academic agent would not exhibit and yet he's exhibiting it. So the logical conclusion to extract from it is that he's not an academic agent, even though he calls himself as such. If I buy an apple from the apple merchant, he's gained a gold piece from me, but I've gained an apple from him. The money I give is not simply in exchange for the apple itself, it is also in exchange for the time and effort the merchant has put in to having the apple picked from a tree and transported to the marketplace. Well, of course, he's going to introduce the typical happy land uh, toy as example of the apple merchant that gives somebody an apple and then the other person gives them money and everyone is happy. Of course, he's going to do he's going to introduce this single exchange as if this was representative of every other exchange, right? And and he might want to know that Alan Smith did not think that every exchange works like this and that everyone always gains from commerce again because. Adam Smith was not so simplistic. He actually understood that there were conflicting interests and that in the market everyone is expected to behave in the manner that benefits them the most. So if you have to shortcut or if you have to not be as legitimate as you should otherwise be in order to put your own interests forth, then Adam Smith saw that people would do this. And this is exactly how markets work. Just look at the 2008 financial crisis. What happened? in those free markets. Well, what happened is that the lenders decided to give junk loans to people that were not going to be able to pay back those loans, especially the adjustable rate mortgages, and then they sold them away to other people who were willing to buy those loans because they thought that they were good to good stuff because the rating agencies and, and the originators and everyone was saying, oh, this is amazing stuff. And this very uh, beneficial practice actually took down the entire 
financial system and the entire economy, not only in the US, but in Europe and in uh, worldwide. So the markets work in this manner, okay? People want to put forth their interests and that is how you expect them to behave. Not everyone is going to behave like that. Adam Smith also didn't say this, but you expect that people are going to put their interest above all other considerations to the extent where if they have to shortcut, they will. And this is the, the essence of markets. The essence of markets is competition. It's conflict. It's not, oh, I voluntarily give away this and you give me this other thing and everyone gains. Yeah, it can be that in certain scenarios, but it's not always that. So stop pretending, okay? Stop pretending like this is a correct representation of markets because it isn't. And even the classical economists, with which he's going to make, uh, he's going to make them sound like they were in favor of this, understood that markets do not behave in this very simple and very beneficial manner for everyone and and yeah, okay, so stop pretending. The third point is international trade is not a zero-sum game either because comparative advantage leaves everyone better off in the long run. This is David Ricardo's famous insight. Okay, so lesson three and I was actually waiting for this one. I was waiting for the lesson that said that all international trade is beneficial for every single party once again. The, a neoclassical argument that this, this time actually Ricardo did suggest this. Because when it came to uh, competition within a nation, Ricardo suggested that competition drives out of business those companies that, uh, well, are inefficient and they sell at higher uh, prices because their costs are higher. Now, he understood that this mechanism worked within a nation, but he, uh, because he was wrong, suggested that this didn't hold true when it came to international trade because he was a uh, he was in favor of the quantity theory of money the classical quantity theory of money and he suggested that when comp when nations that are better at producing commodities than other nations outcompete those poor nations that produce uh, were inefficient poor nations that produce at higher costs what he suggested is that what is going to happen is that the gold that is going to flow from the poor nations to the rich nations is going to make it so that the prices so that the prices yeah in that rich nation suddenly go up because there's a lot of money going around in that economy and when there is more money than goods when a lot of money is seeking a very limited amount of goods and services then you can expect the prices of those goods and services to go up so he's going to suggest that suddenly the poor nations are going to have a price level such that is going to become uh, even well it's going to be smaller than the price level in the rich nation and thus gold is going to flow back into the poor nation, the non-developed nation, and this is going to make it so that trade is balanced and everyone specializes in what they produce better and, and so on and so forth. And this is, a, a, in theory, a, a valid theory, but in practice this is actually not sound because this is not what we see empirically. This is absolutely what we do not see. And this is something that many other economists, even in the classical tradition, were against. Marx, for example, suggested that Ricardo was wrong because when that money that goes from the poor nations to the rich nations, uh, when that money comes into the rich nations, it doesn't just stay circulating in the economy so that prices go up. It actually means that the interest rate in that country is going to lower. And if the interest rate lowers in that country relative to the poor nation where the interest rate is relatively higher, then those in the rich nation are going to be incentivized to lend money to the poor nation so that the nations that lose in commerce are going to become chronically debtors unless there's some productivity or technological uh, well exogenous um, improvement in productivity and in technology and so on or better institutions that make it so that the poor nation can compete with the with the rich nation but ceteris paribus if the rich nation outcompetes the poor nation, then that poor nation is destined to become 
a debtor that it, meaning that it's going to have to be borrowing money all the time in order to finance its inefficient industries chronically and adam smith also saw this as a thing he did not have a mechanism like ricardo through which a poor nation can actually outcompete a rich nation because and this is again this is something that we do not see if this were the case we would see poor nations already beating in commerce in rich nations and this is not what we see what we see is precisely what marx described where rich nations that outperform those poor nations more inefficient nations in commerce being the ones that then lend money back so that ones become uh, lenders chronically and the other ones become borrowers chronically and they have to face all the time the burden of having to borrow money and and again so leverage for them so this is again he's going to take the only classical economist uh, the, uh, meaning david ricardo that had this theory which is actually wrong not because it's invalid because it's valid the logic uh, follows uh, from it but because it's unsound because the empirics don't fit within it and there's other theories that even though sometimes it does i mean commerce is again commerce is not just always bad or, or always good and the policy implications of this can be various i'm not defending uh, in any sense uh, protectionist measures because this is uh, uh, this is something that we're going to look in the in my series on the classical political economists when we look at international trade but for now the only thing that he's going to extract is that very lesson from David Ricardo that international trade is and notice how he's not going to cite Adam Smith on this because Adam Smith didn't believe this so if he were to cite Adam Smith then he would be uh, arguing in favor of a position on trade that suggested that trade is not necessarily uh, going to balance out between rich nations and, and poor nations so again what a nice ideologically convenient lesson isn't it right that you need pick the things that you like and you leave aside everything else and the discussions and the conflicts in the classical tradition of economics and the debates he's going to abstract from all of that and he's just going to nitpick you know this lesson this other lesson that somehow they are also the lessons that neoclassical economists extract ignoring everything else like the falling rate of profit why is he not going to suggest that the falling rate of profit is like ricardo suggested the most important the, uh, the most important fact about um, a political economy why is he not going to take this as a lesson well ideological convenience number four is say's law which says in order to uh, demand goods you must first supply goods you cannot simply demand something into existence well here we go the fourth lesson and of course and i was again expecting this was says law which is going to describe in this one simple line that is not entirely true i mean says law is not just about this simple line where oh in order to consume you must produce um again i have uh, three videos in in on says law in uh, in this channel you can look them up there's different meanings of says law and Keynes uh, misinterpret some part of it and so on he's even going to criticize Keynes for this even though he's not even going to uh, well, he's going to criticize Keynes for this, and then he's going to use Keynes's definition of classical economists, as we will see. Let, for now, I mean, on says law, I've already said uh, a lot of things, and the main conclusion from this is that uh, Marx, uh, which uh, under my definition is a classical economist, because he's the, the he develops the classical uh, arguments, um, Marx showed how even within the framework of says law crises are always and everywhere possible so uh call it general gloss call it partial gloss whatever you want but crises are always and everywhere possible under even within the framework of says law so yeah i don't really have too much to say about that uh, only that of course he's going to put says law and not even going to comment on the on the different controversies between uh, Sismondi and Malthus and this why because you know again why even presented when you can just say one simple line then uh, criticize Keynes a little bit and that's it okay and buried in this is a fifth lesson from classical economics 
every part of the economy is connected to the whole of the economy, so small changes in one part will reverberate throughout the economy. Leon Walrus. What? Leon Walrus. So Leon Walrus is now a classical economist. Well, this is a very keen insight because until now I thought that the classical economists were precisely the economists before the marginalist revolution. And Leon Walras being one of the of the people that were in charge of bringing about neoclassical economics, I would it would be one of the last people on earth to put as the classical economists, but yet he's going to do it. And notice why he's go and notice this is precisely Keynes's definition of classical economists, which are all economists before him, before Keynes. So, he, so, so then, what this academic agent is doing here is criticizing Keynes for not understanding the classical economists, and then presenting Keynes's definition of of the classical economists by putting Leon Walras as a classical economist and. Uh, this is general equilibrium theory is precisely not a lesson from classical economists. For, I, I mean, uh, general equilibrium theory is the kind of theory that was put forth in order to uh, ignore the classical economists and their theories on competition, on trade, on labor theory of value, on surplus value, and so on. So. So I this is this is just to me is baffling. Why? Why would he do this? Now we know that Keynes was wrong, and and we've been know this for a, for a while that there was a marginalist revolution and that all economists after that are neoclassical. So I'm just baffled, baffled. And if the lesson that he wants to extract from general equilibrium theory is that actions in some parts of the economy repercute, they end up having consequences in other parts of the economy, well, you don't need uh, Leon Walras for that. Uh, the classical economists before the marginalized revolution already knew this. This is not a very keen insight, you know, when you do something somewhere, it's going to have consequences seen or not seen. You know, you, you, you remember, if you have studied the classical economists, you might remember this distinction, you know, the seen and the not seen. Uh, so you know you don't really need for this Leon Walras. Why even include it there? Bizarre. This is to me. This is just bizarre. The sixth lesson is that of marginal utility, uh, which is simply the charge that both the value and utility are entirely subjective. And if presenting general equilibrium theory as a lesson from classical economics wasn't enough, he's going to put marginal utility as a lesson from classical economists, which is, again, the most bizarre thing on earth. Marginal utility was specifically designed to contrast, to be contrasted with the theory of value of the classical economists, which was the labor theory of value. The labor theory of value is the key lesson on, in, with respect to value to be extracted from the classical economists, not marginal utility. Marginal utility was a reaction to the labor theory of value. So again, um, wh what are we even doing here? Are we discussing the classical economists? What are we doing? Here we're just, uh, what we're doing is just discussing his own mental ideological uh, construct that he has there built in order to uh, convince himself and everyone else that he's a rational thinking academic agent that uh, knows everything about economics and can teach everyone else all these lessons, very keen lessons on economics. Again, uh, very bizarre, very bizarre. In older economic theories, a value was said to be determined entirely by the cost of production, that is, the total cost of labor plus the total capital investment. But this is not true. And in this point, I want to comment a, a couple of things, but this this point it just shows that he hasn't learned from the debate he did on the labor theory of value, because he's again going to conflate uh, different notions of value. He's going to say value and He's not very clear with what he means. I take that f for value, he means price, he means exchange value, and he's going to say value and utility are subjective. So yes, utility is subjective. Uh, how useful 
you find something it's uh well it's subjective it's something that you find use in things not things don't find use in you you know so that is absolutely uh subjective so prices are prices subjective if if by value you mean prices well uh they are subjective i mean last time i went to the store to buy chicken uh there was a price on on chicken and if i had said oh no my subjective valuation of this chicken is a lower price uh i, I wouldn't have bought that chicken because um the store didn't sell it for for less than what it said so um what do you mean by subjective uh with i mean sure it's subjective in the sense that people decide what they want to pay for things and whether or not they want to pay for things or not but if you want to pay for something and there's competition and there's society enters in the picture then as we said in the last video certain laws come into play and then producers start to take into consideration their costs because they're going to have to sell if competition is included they're going to have to sell very close to their costs because if they sell above those costs then someone is going to sell below those costs and they're going to outcompete them so um uh, so if if by value you mean exchange value well it's subjective i mean depending on what you consider it to be subjective or not but the classicals didn't think that value was exchange value they thought that value was well marx thought that value was abstract socially necessary labor time so is that objective well it's subjective in the sense that uh, it takes an objective amount of labor time of socially necessary labor time to produce a given commodity in a specific point of time it doesn't mean that uh, because you produce something and that cost you this x amount of labor time that you're going to sell it in the market at exactly cost covering price no no this is this this is not what the classic has meant this is precisely uh, the criticism uh, of says law that is wrong because says law is not saying that everyone is going to find uh, a market at cost covering prices so it's the same goes for the labor theory of value it's not the labor theory of exchange value you, you notice this the labor theory of value and value regulates exchange value but uh, again this subjective of is it objective is it subjective I, I don't care what you call it uh, so long as we're speaking about the same object i don't care you call it subjective objective i don't care okay so utility is subjective and the classicals as i showed in my last video understood that utility is subjective so marginal utility really is an attempt to uh, ignore the labor theory of value and present another one that is ideologically convenient for the bourgeoisie which it is, and that's why it prevailed in bourgeois circles, and that's why it's now the orthodoxy. But at the time, when this theory hadn't been developed, the labor theory of value was the prevalent one, even among bourgeois economists, because they were true to their logic, and they were true to what they saw and to, and to what they experienced in, 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 in economic reality. Now economics is really, uh, uh, it lives in another world, uh, not in reality. Now it's trying to analyze some idealized version of markets, the general equilibrium version of it that we do in our economics classes and where you have to optimize and you have to use very complex math in order to solve for optimization problems and again and so on. So this is not the classical uh, a classical lesson and this is just a way to ignore the labor theory of value because the labor theory of value was not disproven by marginal utility because if marginal utility like he's trying to say there suggests that utility is subjective well the classic has already said that so again uh, this discussion just it, it seems very bizarre to me once again as we see practically every week on shows like dragon's den you can spend a lot of time money and effort on a project and still nobody will want it and if nobody wants it its value is zeros well congratulations you just discovered that if people don't want to pay for something they will not pay for something unless somebody convinces them somehow of it and thus the price of that thing is going to be zero yeah i mean the classicals didn't know this they, they weren't aware of this they thought that people paid for things even if they didn't want to pay for those things yes this is a very good criticism of the labor theory value amazing this is uh, such a keen insight, I mean, 
this is a, a amazing ergonomic theory. Oh, let me tell you where I am. I'm out. Indeed, indeed, you are out. You are out of touch with the actual basic arguments of the classical economists. What both uh, Karl Menger in Austria and W. Stanley Jevons here in good old Blighty pointed out, separately and independently, but around the same time, uh, which is the 1870s incidentally, is that even use value is subjective. What? Even use value is subjective. Even use value is subjective? It's precisely use value is subjective. It's, it's, it's not like before uh, Karl Menger, everyone thought that use value was not subjective. This is, I, I mean, ridiculous. Oh, so, so he's presenting it as, yes, Karl Menger and Jebans, these two economists living in different parts of the world, but after a lot of study, they realized that use value is subjective. What? What? I mean, this is a dishonor to, to even these economists, because this is not what their research is about. Their, their research is a lot more, more complicated than just, oh, use value is subjective. Everyone knows that. Everyone knows that use value is subjective. I, wow, <laughs> this, is, this is amazing. So anyhow, this is it for now. I, I hope you enjoyed this video. You had some fun at least, even though, you know, we're speaking about uh, well, think that a lot of people would find boring, you know, the classical economists and all of this. But um, yeah, well, um, you can support me again by subscribing, liking the video, and so on. Um, I'm out.